Welcome back to the C-Mask podcast, where alongside Nicholas Stomphauser, Mike Pantile, and also Timothy Gordon, who can't make it here today, we discuss Christian masculinism every Friday, giving you the information you need to live a better life for yourself and your family and glorify God. And today, we're going to have a look at some models of biblical manhood. I am a full-time literature tutor. That's how I provide for my family. And for many years, I was a school teacher before I was fired for a lecture on masculinity. And one of the questions I always got from young guys was, what characters do I look up to? What books should they read to learn how to become more masculine? And almost invariably, the expectation was it would be someone like Achilles or Odysseus, some fictional pagan hero. And it always made me wonder why more guys don't turn to the Bible to look for models of masculine men. Because the great thing about these stories is they're true. These are real men, and they have some of the most important messages to teach us. So before we get into looking at the story of Noah and what it can teach us about the qualities that men need to display today, I want to know from you, first of all, Nick, did you ever have this question on your mind what books do i need to read to become more masculine yeah i had a um comic book bible when i was a kid it was the coolest book that i had it was the best way that i could read the bible because it was like you know illustrated just like marvel comics and i remember <clears throat> samson the story of samson uh and delilah and just seeing him like represented similar to how thor was represented in uh, you know, the other comic books that I would read. But yeah, there was there was definitely some exploration on masculinity, but I don't think it was ever presented in the in the way that you're talking about it right now, of like what's the model? It's more like how do you man, the literature today, especially whether it's self-help, like you know, Mark Mason or Manson, whatever the guy's name is, and like that entire genre of stuff. And then all the way to sort of the red pill content, it's more of how do you impose your will on the environment and not really how do you be a man? There's not really a lot of good stuff like that out there. Mm -hmm. So you're still looking, you're still looking for books that give you kind of insights, right? I guess I, I stopped looking at books and just more started looking toward Catholicism for it. And mm -hmm. there was a, a pivot that happened when, and it took about two years of fully appreciating, and I'm still appreciating the depth of it, that Christ is a masculine figure because for the first 23, 24 years of my life, uh, he was just sort of like a socialist. And so um, recognizing that the, uh, the you should read, Will, maybe, I don't know about this episode, but at some point, the Cardinal Newman quote that you sent me about what masculinity is. And it's like the more that I have demands placed on me in my work or my relationships, it, the more I realize that responding with, you know, humility instead of rashness is the masculine response. Responding with patience instead of um, exasperation and all these things where I, I originally you would think that that's weakness. And now I'm starting to realize that like the amount of strength that somebody like Christ had to have to endure being spat on, uh, you know, with the um, crowning with thorns, I think, but, you know, today's Friday, I'm going to pray that rosary today, crowning with thorns. Um, and then when he's up on the cross and he's being taunted, it's like that, until you're put in those positions, you don't realize how much it requires <clears throat> a superior level of, of strength uh, to behave counter mm -hmm. to what your flesh wants to. Yeah, so important. So much of it is about restraint because any toddler can throw a tantrum. No matter how big his muscles are, it's still a tantrum. And just mentioning Christ there, obviously, that's the ultimate masculine role model. Just reminds me, though, of that importance of restraint. When they come to arrest him in the garden and they say, you know, is this you? Is this is this Christ? And then he just says, yes, it's me. And then everyone around him falls to the floor like because of the power of his voice. 
And then you realize, oh, there's no reason at all why um, he would go through with this if it wasn't his will to do so. Like just speaking made all the soldiers hit the deck. He didn't even have to lift a finger. And then you realize that it's about the restraint from then on in. Like I'm letting you take me because it's my will that this happens in submission to the father. Great point, Nick. How about you, Mike? You've had a long journey in your own thoughts about masculinity and how you developed from the red pill world. Was there a time when you thought there was like a magic book that had all the answers? Yeah. And so this is why this conversation is so important because there's not a lot of uh, masculine men such as yourself, Nick, Tim, talking, having these discussions about these biblical figures, because, um, um, when you look at it at face value and you don't have the capacity to understand or nor do the care to understand, maybe because, you know, like me or poorly catechized or what have you, you look to the world for these examples. And so what I found myself entrenched in was uh, the red pill world. And then the book that I felt really spoke to me was The Way of Men by Jack Donovan. You did a... <laughs> an incredible article and I think a video as, as well on that. And I was like, Oh, this is it. Strength, courage, mastery, and honor, bro. Like this is what it is. And now looking back, it's, it's obviously, you know, there's a lot of words I could use to describe that probably would get us flagged on YouTube. So we'll just, we'll save that discussion for a different day. But, uh, um, uh, yeah, that was, I remember having this distinct, distinct, uh, conversation in my head. I said, I need to find a book that, that teaches me how to be a man. So I found this thing and it became like my Bible for a short period of time. And then as I've grown in my faith and have returned to the, the Catholic faith, I realized that everything that we understand about masculinity is the antithesis to the flesh. It's like the opposite of male nature. And this is why like masculinity and virtue, that is part of the same conversation, part of the same sentence, almost part of the same word, because outside of it, it's just kind of machismo. Just like you said, I mean, any man can have muscles, but it can also make him effeminate. It's like a U shape that Nick, you and I had this conversation where you started to battle effeminacy, but you get to a point where you're effeminate now as a result. Right. Yeah. And so if you're a guy that has this aggression and it's unbridled, untamed aggression, well, you're now no different than a toddler. Cause we could say that, you know, these men that are in prison, they're quite manly dudes, but are like they are they masculine dudes? Are they virtuous men? So that's why that conversation of virtue is so important. And so what I now look to is not just, you know, figures in the Bible for me who really I resonate with is St. Paul because he had quite the past and then now became this 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 bold, outspoken uh, advocate for Christ, of course. Right. Leading up to his um, his martyrdom. I'm reading the books like Traditional Virtues According to Aquinas and Confessions by St. Augustine, and I'm really starting to realize, wow, this is so opposite to fallen human nature, that, that the conversation of virtue has to be part of it, um, because it's exactly what we outlined with, with Christ. He seems like this hippy-dippy figure, but when you really parse those things out and you extract the meaning from what he did during his ministry up to his crucifixion and resurrection, that is masculinity and virtue in action in the greatest form of it. Yeah. And some of it is just such a slap around the head for guys who are deep in the red pill worldview. Like Christ chose to live at home until he was 30. Okay? <laughs> some of these guys is like, oh, you live in your mom's basement. <laughs> no, God himself chose to live at home until age 30. There's just lots of gems in there that we can discuss as we go through. Well, but there's also one that will probably pivot well to to Noah and that is um, the idea of submission or being sort of a fool for God doing whatever he tells you like Christ in the garden submits to the will of the father so God submits as a son to the authority of the father and we are supposed to as you know sort of the bride of Christ submit to Christ like a woman submits to her husband it's obviously a, a different um, like species, same genus, or, you know, however you might say it. And the notion of submission, I was just having this conversation with a friend of mine, uh, seems so emasculating. But if you're submitting to proper authority, there's nothing emasculating about that. That's actually true masculinity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, you, you see that even in some of the pagan literature of the past, which isn't so steeped in liberalism. And the greatest dream of the top warriors, the knights, is to have a lord to submit to. 
That's what they're all looking for. And it's outside the context of Christianity. They just want a noble guy that they can devote their lives to. So submission and masculinity go together in a deep way. And this is why we talk about hierarchy and authority. We believe in it. It's important for women and also for men too. And the man is the one who has to lead in that, as in all things. And coming back to the great pagan classics, like with Achilles, like with Odysseus, my starting point for explaining the great difference between that worldview and the Christian worldview was normally that Dante, in his great poem, The Divine Comedy, puts both of those two Greek heroes in hell, right? Achilles and Odysseus both land in hell. And this tells us that they're deeply flawed as men, like the wily Odysseus who resorts to lying, trickery, cunning. And then Achilles, who in some ways physically is the most alpha you can get, but can't control his wrath, can't control his temper, which makes him a weak man overall. So we have to look elsewhere for them. And Dante gives us a hint, really, by placing Hector, who I would tell students is actually the true hero of the Iliad, in limbo, right? Hector gets a lot of it right. Not all of it, but he makes it to limbo. And why is that? Well, ultimately, it's about uh, self-sacrifice. Like He knows there was no chance, really, of beating Achilles, but he goes out there and he does his duty anyway. So that idea of submission and doing your duty is what I want to bring out of Noah's story. And I'll just read through an article I wrote about Noah, called it Riding the Storm. And I had the idea to write this after, after I was watching the Russell Crowe movie version of Noah's story with my kids, mm -hmm. just thinking about what are the points here that we can really dwell on and absorb moving forwards. And these are the things I was thinking of. So... The story of Noah and the flood is a model of fortitude, faith, and fear. Fortitude, said the Reverend Charles Callan, is like a strong tower or like an army that protects the other virtues. Without fortitude, for example, a judge will be too scared to give the just verdict. What if he gets cancelled? But in a corrupt world, Noah had the courage to do only what was pleasing to God. Does that resonate with you, Mike? The idea that without fortitude, the other virtues can't really stand. The judge won't have the balls to actually give the just verdict. Well, it's without fortitude, it's it's flimsy. Where does it stand on? What's the foundation? It's like, are you going to make it on concrete? Or are you going to make it on sand? So you have to have some semblance of this fortitude to protect the other virtues. Because otherwise, when you're met with conflict or adversity or a low point in your life what what is going to be sort of the the mast or the sail if you will that keeps the ship right uh, on the stormy waters through those times and so i think that's why faith and fortitude are inextricably linked together you can't have faith without fortitude and you can't have true fortitude without faith because you understand that your fortitude and your strength comes from god and that no matter what, you have to submit to his will, no matter what's going on and your, your head is down and everything could be going completely astray and crazy, but it's that fortitude that keeps you standing strong in that, in that mighty wind. Um, um, and so with, but without faith, what, what does it become? I mean, you become like a, you become like an Andrew Tate figure. So you could say he's a for, formidable guy. He's got some semblance of fortitude, but never bend the knee, never surrender. Okay. So now accept your place in hell. That's it. That idea of putting God first and knowing that your fortitude comes from him is a big one, Nick, but it can be difficult to really only focus on doing what's pleasing to God. That's such a tough test. I didn't know that fortitude is the primary gift of the Holy Spirit until recently. I would have assumed that it was something like peace or yeah. uh, zeal or something like joy. Uh, I, all of those I expected, but apparently it's fortitude. Um, <clears throat> and it's the only thing that matters is doing what's pleasing to God. And it's the most impossibly hard thing to do in every single situation. So it really seems worthless to have, um, to strive for any other virtue. If you're not going to stick with it for more than a half hour. Um, I, I 
posted this in the the marriage mastery group the other day about the non-negotiables as a guy of like, what's something that I know I'm going to do every single day, no matter what happens in my life. And it doesn't even matter what the thing is that you do. There should just be something that you as a man do every day, no matter what. And for me, it's the rosary. And basically every single time that I go to pray the rosary, all I have going through my head is, man, I really don't want to do this. Me too. I have yet, <laughs> I have yet to reach the, the, you know, the first stage of Aristotelian continence where I'm like excited to go be a holy person and like pray the rosary. It's, I'm not there yet. So I'm fully reliant mm -hmm. on, on grace to not listen to the fact that I'm sleepy and I'm hungry and I don't want to pray this rosary right now. And I'd much rather just go to bed or scroll Twitter. And I was uh, talking to my friend Thomas about this, that how, how effeminate the intellect can be just this constant reasoning, this constant academic conversation about things and how masculine the will is that once you've determined that a certain behavior or a certain virtue or a certain practice is good and something that you should do as a man, all of the time that you then dedicate to intellectualizing it is very, very gay. Just do the damn thing. And if you if that means you have to then pray for the grace of fortitude to do the thing, that's fine. But whatever you have to do, figure out how to just keep doing the thing instead of thinking about the the philosophizing around the thing that you think you're supposed to be doing. Right. Yeah, so true. And when I was late teens, early 20s, that's one of the main things about Nietzsche that appealed to me, like the will to power. So you just decide what it is you want and you go after it. It was only later when I got the full Christian understanding of how not only the intellect is darkened by original sin, but also the will is weakened that I realized willpower just by yourself isn't always the answer. It can get you some of the way, but not all of the way, because you actually need to pray for the grace to overcome some of the temptations that will otherwise derail your will. And look, this might be something like trying to be more patient with people. There are plenty of guys who look very alpha and in command of their willpower. But when it comes to patience and things like humility, they find that really tough. Like listening to someone who's whining about struggles with weight loss, for example. For a guy who's never had those experiences, that can really test your patience and reveal a weakness in your character. You haven't got the willpower to see it through, even though you might know it's a good thing to do. So that was a big shift in opinion for me. And building on that idea, next point I had about Noah was this. He was too manly to be distracted by pleasure or deterred by pain. When people mocked him, he stood strong. As St. Augustine said, we detect weakness in a mind which cannot bear physical oppression or the stupid opinion of the mob. The true fight is staying true to what's right and cancel culture is a symptom of an effeminate culture. It only works on men too weak to bear the stupid opinion of the mob. Something so exciting for the naughty kid inside me just to hear St. Augustine calling the mob stupid. I love it. <laughs> once you capitulate, once you apologize, you've lost and you'll forever lose. Why do you think that is, Mike? Because why well, I think people ex they can now they understand that there's an exposed weakness and they'll forever exploit it. Because okay, we can break this guy once, we'll be able to break him again. He can break character, he can break morality, he can go against his own principles. He's not a principled guy, therefore we could take advantage of him like a a puppet on a string. Yeah. That's it. It's like when the gangster comes knocking for money and you give him some. He's coming again and he's asking for more. It's like a stare down in an MMA fight. You see the two guys, you know, you almost know who's going to win based off of who breaks eye contact, who breaks frame in that moment. It's like you just cannot capitulate to the mob ever. And in fact, if you're getting pushback on anything, you know, um, especially with regards to faith or just being a normal man in the 21st century, you, it's a sign that you're over the target. The amount of stuff that I got the shit flinging when I became a Catholic or I started inquiring Catholicism was immense 
that to me was like because just just like you will i'm the i'm the same as you when i start getting pushback it fuels me even more i'm like i'm not you think i'm gonna bend now because you're you're making fun of me you're saying some stuff about the guy with the funny hat called the pope bro this is just i'm just gonna go and educate myself even more it further reinforces my point thank you very much for the motivation <laughs> <laughs> that's it's, well said nick it's the stupid opinion is scary though yeah I don't know that we appreciate how scary it was for Noah. So he built the ark for 120 years. Uh, Cause this is, this wasn't a small boat. This thing was like one of the twin towers on its side. It was giant and uh, hashtag never forget. And <laughs> additionally, the, the Genesis says that the people of the world were consumed with evil thoughts and they had only evil on their hearts at all times. And it was so bad that God decided to destroy his entire creation. And I don't think we appreciate even now today with how bad things are, that it was worse then. Um, you know, there were entire cities dedicated to sin and late and, and we now know them by their name of, of that sin. Um, and there was also, depending on how esoteric you want to get, some maybe interspecies stuff going on as well, because uh, Noah and his family were described as pure in the eyes of God, but the word pure is tamim, which is pure like the pure red heifer, which is to say genetically pure, meaning that they weren't doing what the other people groups were doing, which was really, really messed up stuff. And so not only was he like not caring what the other people were saying, but it was probably very dangerous. Like this wasn't just losing uh, a job or a status in society. I think it was like he and his family were the pariahs and he probably had to have his head on a swivel for over a century trying to do what he was trying to do. So right. it's, we, we have it incomparably easy and the stuff that I think men fold on today is, uh, is laughable. Yeah. And the reason Noah did what he did and serve God as he did was actually to show true love for his neighbor. Like with all that going on around you, what is the correct response? And that's the next thing I was thinking about when I was watching the film with the kids, that Noah had real love of his neighbor. He knew his fellow men were on the road to ruin, but he didn't tell them to enjoy the decline. You guys have probably heard that red pill phrase, enjoy the decline. You can't do that without being the decline. So for 120 years, instead of bitching, he built like a man with all his muscle and might because he had a mission. His love of his neighbor was real and practical. 1 John 3.18, let us show our love by the true test of action, not by taking phrases on our lips. And for me, this is a reminder that Christianity, when you look at Christ hanging on the cross, it's about incarnation. That's the main thing that we have to look at, the heart of our religion. It's about incarnation. What will you do with your bones and your blood to live this out? And Noah's story is a great example of that. It's too easy just to talk, isn't it, Mike? Yeah, too easy to talk, and it's very easy to... Um uh, share comforting lies instead of the offensive, uncomfortable truth. I mean, that's, that's what Jesus represented. That's why he was crucified. He came and he spoke the truth. That's how much he loved all of us. And yeah, he sat with sinners, but he also told the sinners that they were sinning and that they needed to repent that, yeah, I love you. It's my grace that invites you into this conversation and invites you into salvation. But now you've got to change your ways. It's not like, well, now I'm saved because I believe in you. It's like, no, you got to change everything about you. There's these certain tingles and pleasures and things that you, 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 you have become so integral to your identity, whether it's your sexual orientation, how much food you want to eat or what have you. And you, for my litmus test of a, of a man in, in friendship and brotherhood, does he love me enough to tell me the truth and grab me by the scruff of the shirt and tell me what I don't want to hear? That's how I know that guy actually loves me because he's willing to put our friendship on the line in love of truth. That's a man that if you're going to share a compliment with the man, the, one of the greatest compliments you could share was I would go to war with you. And so a man that is able to 
say, okay, I'm going to sacrifice his friendship because I care so much about the truth and I care so much about this man and his soul, especially with conversation about faith, that I'm willing to have this conversation. That That's at the heart of true brotherhood, at the heart of true faith. It's that. It's the, uh, the, the offensiveness of the truth. Mm -hmm, right. And the book of Proverbs is full of warnings against the soft flatterer who only tell you what pleases you. So that's a that's great right. insight, Mike. And you knew that I loved you when I bullied you in Instagram DMs about Protestantism, right? Bro, yes. The one of the <laughs> one of the, the the greatest exchanges we had. He goes, "Do you know what the word heretic, the word the root word for the word heretic comes from?" Right? I said, "No, chooser." He goes, "You're aware of the church and its teachings, and you've sort of like willfully turned the cheek." Because you're you're acting like a heretic, and that was very sobering. I wasn't like emotionally offended. I was like, oh man, like, okay, this guy, this guy cares. He's maybe I don't agree with what he's saying, but that was, that was a catalyst, man. That was, and it, it, yeah, it, uh, it just goes, it, it goes to show you, this is why our, our relationship and our friendship has become what it is now is because of, you, you just didn't care. I could have just blocked you after that, but you're like, yeah, whatever. The truth yeah, is the truth, bro. I knew you wouldn't stay mad. Me. That's it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Nick, I, I noticed you nodding when I said you can't enjoy the decline without being the decline. Yeah. Um, you said it's all about incarnation. Um, chooser. Th there was something that I just heard from Fulton Sheen that is what Protestantism is. Um, though I don't think he was necessarily intending to describe that. So in Catholicism, the Logos, truth itself becomes flesh. And then that man behaved a certain way. And in his behavior, he did not err. And so that means that if you look to the historical and narrative behavior of the person of Christ, and then you replicate it, you are expressing with your life truth itself. So it goes from abstract, from truth proposition to being, and then the expression of being through willpower, through life. Protestantism and the world today is also sort of the inverse of that, which is first it's flesh, and then we're sort of expressing ideas and it's coming from within us and going outward. And this is like the enlightenment of, or, or as Ripperger would say, the heresy of, of imminence. How does it make me feel? What's my opinion? We're starting from the point of the flesh and we're extrapolating outward and imposing on the world, imposing on being um, our opinions about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, that... and so like with, yeah, you're going to enjoy no. the decline. You have to, that's this. Well, go ahead, Will. You you know what I'm saying. Uh, it's so insightful, and some of the smartest Catholic responses to the Reformation as it was unfolding actually said, "Look, um, Protestantism hasn't produced the principle of private judgment. It is itself a product of it. These yeah. people, first and foremost, are saying, I am my own ultimate theological authority.'" So it's basically liberalism in the sphere of religion, which is why it's splintered into so many different sects. So it's a great insight that you got there, Nick. I hadn't thought about it that way before, but it can it can come at a great cost if you truly are willing to lose all these easier, more comforting answers. And to put it bluntly, lifestyles as well, contraception being one of them, lifestyles that are open to you if you're willing to go against the teachings of God. So the next point for Noah I had was this. It was Noah's fear of God that meant he was prepared to lose the whole world rather than the friendship of God. Holy fear was the key to his fortitude. The man who fears men more than he fears God is weak. And why is that? Because if people can make him ashamed to make the sign of the cross, they can eventually make him break it. It's important to remember this. If you're out at a restaurant, for example, you're going to say grace 
before meals or with secular relatives, for example? Like, what do you stand for in that moment in your flesh? I, my whole, this is actually, well, before I get to that point, this is why I think what uh, you said about the saints being the most mentally healthy people was, was such a, is such a great point because their postures were toward eternity, not toward the life now that is so fleeting, even though it feels like drudgery and it just drags on forever sometimes that they were able to withstand that suffering because of that orientation and because of the fortitude that they had. But also um, it it is the, at least for me, the holy fear that brought me back to Catholicism. It's like, I actually didn't understand my point. And I'm fearful just as much as I, of, of God, as just as much as I love him. And if my posture isn't inclined or oriented toward eternity, what is it oriented toward? Like, what am I prepared to die for? How can I properly guide the souls of my family? And am I an, am I a, a a puppet that's easily manipulated by the world and the wind and 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 the swaying to and fro, depending on what direction it's going? And it's it's no. And so that holy fear is a is a is a compass, and it's like a light that shines through the fog. Oftentimes, that um, you know. I mean, I, I go back to you know, do not be afraid. It's like okay, well, do not be afraid about anything in this life be afraid, be fearful of God, because that's ultimately going to guide you where ultimately where you want to be. And that is in eternity and and saved, you know, rejoicing and praising God for the rest of time with the saints. Um, that's at least what comes to mind for holy fear for me. Nick, how about you? The phrase imminentize the eschaton uh, is one of my favorites, which is to say, bring, you know, the four last things, heaven, hell, death and judgment to the forefront of your mind and keep it there at all times. Um, the Stoics would do this, but they were, they were kind of gay because they didn't believe in, uh, you know, heaven, hell, death, and judgment. Maybe they had Olympus or paradise or something like that, but um, screw tape letters is really good for this. Um, highly recommend everybody read that because uh, the project of the demons is to keep your mind in the past or in the future, but never on heaven or on the present moment, because that's where God lives. Mm -hmm. And so you can be endlessly anxious about an endless number of things. If the perspective on heaven, hell, death, and judgment is always kept at a distance. And when I hear about this, you guys talk about fear of God like that. I feel like it, it, it has to come from, uh, a relationship and an awareness that requires a lot of cultivation. Um, I think you have to have some precedent in order to really respect the authority of God. Um, and you have to have some level of love to not want to hurt the person of God. Mm -hmm. Other, Otherwise it's more of an algebraic problem of, well, I, I want to make sure there's enough points on the right hand side of this equation when I die versus like that's a person with whom I'm engaged with and I don't want to harm them. That would hurt me to hurt them. Um, and so this is, I think, where atheists miss a lot because they think when we say fear of God, um, it's sort of just a gun to the head don't sin or you're going to go to hell that's what we mean by fear of god but it's not it's like i don't want to hurt my girlfriend i don't want to hurt my parents like i love these people and it would devastate me to do something that would hurt them like yeah. that's what we mean by fear of god yeah and you see inklings of it in interpersonal relationships among humans too obviously god's a person but between father and son for example I'll give you a one that I spotted. My son had been working really hard. He wanted to deadlift 400 while still age 14. And he was having a go at it one day before age 15, one day before his birthday. And I could tell from the way he was looking at me and getting nervous that he didn't want to disappoint me, right? He thought, oh, we've been doing this for a long time. Um, Dad's excited about it. So am I. And if I miss the lift, what will dad think? So I just said, don't worry if you miss it. Like, we'll get it another day. It's okay. You put the work in, now the result will take care of itself. Maybe you get it, maybe you won't. I think you can do it. You think you can do it. But I could see he was worried about letting me down. And that is what Aquinas talks about when he explains what contrition really is, right? You might begin 
by being sorry for your sins because you're going to get punished. Like, you don't want to go to purgatory. You don't want to go to hell. You're afraid of that. But he says, no, on a deeper level, contrition versus just attrition is I'm disgusted by my sins because they have offended the all good God. Like that's what's most dishonorable about them. Sure. When the punishment comes, I'll be happy to take it because I deserve it and it's good for me. But what I'm most sorry about is I've offended God. And you see that with mottos that don't seem Christian, like death before dishonor, for example. Guys like the sound of that. Well, that's what it's really about. You should rather die than yeah. offend God with your sins. Yeah. Yeah. Who, which saint was it that said that they would rather their child die than ever commit one mortal sin? I imagine a few have said that. I can't think of one in particular, but we're going to look at uh, Abraham's story next, which is a great example of that, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, holy fear is the key to fortitude, as Nick said, and it's really about death before dishonor, because the purpose of your life should be to glorify God. Now, Noah, although he has all these pressures and temptations, he's confident in God. He's not saying that he can do it all by his own power. So that's the next thing that I want to talk about. Noah had great confidence in God. How would all the animals survive? Would the mountainous waves sink the ark? You can imagine him staying up at night freaking out about this, right? Trying to figure out the physics of it and how it could all work out properly. Instead of allowing himself to be paralyzed by his own anxiety, Noah submitted completely to the will of God. He knew that this was the surest foundation yeah. for the future because because God always keeps his promises. Psalm 36, 5, commit thy way to the Lord and trust in him, and he will do it. Now, when a man realizes this, he becomes formidable because it's the foundation of courage. And what I'm really saying here goes back to some of the earlier C-Mask episodes about anxiety and emasculation. Because if Noah had got in his own head too much and thought that he knew best, I can't put all the animals on an ark together because lions might eat all the others. Crazy plan. He wouldn't have done it. He'd be saying that his vision of the future was more in-depth, more comprehensive than God's, which is insane to think about. But some guys do do that when they let anxiety override them. Nick, what are your thoughts about this? Because of concupiscence, we are prone to doubt. Intellect and will are darkened. And so doubt's really easy. And I find it ironic that, so Noah talks to God, still has anxiety and doubt, but he, he had enough fortitude to do the right thing. But then you have the Israelites. Moses talks to God. They see God, see the Red Sea, pillar of fire, pillar of cloud, still doubt God, not even just doubt. They also then go have an orgy. They also then go worship other gods. Uh, and then you get to Jesus and he's telling the parable of Lazarus and um, uh, so, uh, the, the rich man and Lazarus, not resurrection Lazarus. And the rich man says, go back from the dead and warn my uh, siblings, my brothers and sisters, so that they don't do the same thing that I did. And Jesus says that wouldn't do anything. It wouldn't convince you. These miracles would not convince you. And this kind of goes back to what I was saying about the intellect versus the will. It's like, if you just stay in your head and you keep intellectualizing things and trying to like weigh the odds and do the calculus, as opposed to recognizing that this is either a duty or responsibility or the right action to take, even no matter the outcome, and then just doing it, then you're just being effeminate. Because no amount of data is actually going to convince you, because even when people talked to God, they still doubted. So do you really think that any amount of like 
miracle in your day-to-day -day life that you prayed for and God's going to give you is really going to change anything when it really comes down to a matter of, are you just going to do the thing that you know you're supposed to do? Yeah. One of the best descriptions um, I've heard of prayer is the sacrifice of the will on the altar of the heart, the sacrifice of the will on the altar of the heart. So that's what the submission to God means. And prayer is about letting God do something to us more than it is us doing something ourselves. So prayer is an opening of ourselves to allow the will to be sacrificed on the altar of the heart. It's a great way to think about it because it gets you recognizing your own frailty. And one of the most important things to pray for is the gift of final perseverance, right? We can look at all these great men in the Bible who seem to have it made. Like, no way he's going to fall off. And they do. It's like how St. Paul was talking about suffering produces character, character produces endurance, endurance produces hope. I, I may have gotten the order wrong. And what to me, what's mind blowing is how both anxiety, but complete submission and trust of God can kind of coexist because of this clashing of the flesh and the spirit. And I see this act out in my own life because the flesh or the thorn in my side is like St. Paul calls calls it like the thorn in my side is this constant worry of the future. But it's weird because it's juxtaposed next to this like absolute faith. Not that I doubt God's not going to make everything work out for me and my family. It may not look the way that I want it to do, but I can say like my prayers are mostly oriented towards just guide my steps in the direction you want me to go. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't care where it is. I'll go. Just tell me where to go. Try to erase this fear from my heart and this doubt, because I guess you could say anxiety is kind of almost like a a weird atheism in motion because you don't you're not fully trusting the word the, the will of God. I'm not sure if you guys have experienced this. It's something I'm trying to wrap my head around. But what I can say is since coming back to the church, um, you know, partaking in communion, going to confession, going to mass, going to mass more frequently, I don't crumble under the pressure of anxiety like I did before. I don't go to alcohol. I don't want to numb myself. I I know how to exist in the tension of it. And I guess this is the fortitude piece building up in my heart by the grace of God. Um, that's increased my faith while the anxiety still somehow exists. Yeah. I'm that not makes, sure if you guys have experienced this, but yeah. Makes total together sense, for me. Mike. And the the saints talk about temptations and uh, anxiety as a temptation to a lack of confidence in God certainly is a temptation. They talk about how God allows those temptations to allow us to grow. So when mm. you say those two things coexist, it makes complete sense because having to face that and just continue regardless is helping you have greater confidence in God. It's flexing that trust muscle, if you like, in a way that you wouldn't be able to otherwise without that resistance trying to stop you doing it. So for guys who are struggling with anxiety like that, or for guys who might be struggling with temptations to lust, for example, or pride, they don't mean you're a bad person. They are there to help you grow. You're a bad person if you succumb to them willfully, but if you just pray for the grace to get the temptation to overcome them, then they can help you become a better man. So you shouldn't wish for them to be uh, gone as if they're a part of your life that reveals a flaw in you. How you respond to them is what matters. Uh, Will, two things real quick on that. The first is God will never give you a temptation that you do not have the grace to overcome, Amen. Uh, which is something that's it's kind of a damning proposition because it means you're fully responsible for every failure. Um, and and that the, the, the temptations that you're given are in proportion to the grace that you have to overcome them at the time. And so if you fail, that was on you. That wasn't on God. It's not because God didn't send the Holy Spirit or give you sufficient graces for that. Uh, it means you didn't exercise your will sufficiently. Um, and I think that's important to note because you should strive to push the uh, threshold of where you're falling further and further in, in the positive direction as much as you can. And then pray for the graces to overcome better, better things. And I think as you do that, this is to my second point. Um, I'm becoming more and more astute at recognizing the misdirection that Satan does with relabeling things and then convincing us of the relabel. So let's say you get to a point where you're not in habitual mortal sin and 
you're receiving the sacraments and you're practicing the faith and you have a decent prayer life, um, you might think that you're not experiencing temptations because, oh, you're not lusting or you're not um, sinning with rage or calumny and detraction. You're not gossiping anymore. I would propose that you're not looking hard enough because anxiety anxiety is a temptation, but you just think it's not. You think that it's rational. You think that this, mm. this fretting is the product of just a reasonable mind that's trying to assess dangers. And it's not. As Will, uh, um, Mikey said, it's like atheism in motion. Here's your new temptation. Can you be joyful? Can you be peaceful? That's, yeah. Right. <clears throat> and we talked about how bad things were in the corrupt world around Noah sexually. And Nick was hinting at bestiality and all kinds of other unnatural sexual activity. However, had Noah pridefully refused to submit to God's will, that would have actually been even worse yeah. than what was going on around him. I feel like a lot of the Christian discourse at the moment is focused on dunking on red pill guys for their promiscuity, their fornication. And it's really important to remember that a sin of the flesh like that is less serious than the so-called spiritual sins that we share with the devils, pride, envy. So there's a tradition in the church that the devils were, the higher devils, were said to regard themselves as above tempting men to lust, right? They were too disgusted by it because that's something that we share with the brute animals, the irrational animals. And mm. they were after bigger game, right? They would go after people who imagined that they'd progressed so far in holiness that they couldn't possibly look at a woman's breasts or watch her ass as she walks down the street. Like, that's so far beneath them. No, no, no. We're basically saints. And what they will go for instead is the spiritual sins, the cold ones, pride, envy, far more calculating. And those go under the radar. One is about turning towards the creature. Sins of conversion. You're attracted to something good in what God has made, the beauty of the woman. But the more serious sins are sins of aversion. It's actually setting yourself against God, like in principle, rather than just having an inordinate attachment to a creature. So that, I think, is a real trap in the spiritual life that you just outlined there so well. When you think you're getting holier, sometimes that's a really clear warning that you're not. Because the saints are the ones who always talk about themselves as being bad, right? They know. They know the yeah. depth of it. Yeah, which it should come as a warning. Um, and also a recognition that uh, sin probably follows the Pareto distribution where the worst sins are in the 20%, not the 80%. Like you said, like if you could have the violent deviance of Noah's day and if Noah defected, that would have been worse. Tells you exactly why the saints are onto something that... Mm -hmm. Again, it's like their temptation is in proportion to the grace and the relationship that they have with God. So even a venial sin for them might be, or or I should, maybe I should say, it would be easier for them to mortal sin than, uh, than other people who have a seared conscience and a lack of relationship and awareness of the law. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. We're, the further along you progress in holiness, the more serious your mistakes come. Like the teacher is judged to a higher standard. Same idea. That's yeah. exactly right, Nick. Um, yeah, it's scary, it's scary to think about. Um, but it's really important. A lot of this is scary. Well, it's and also funny because the nobody, anybody who thinks Christianity is weak just doesn't understand what its propositions are. Because no. what we're saying is the game gets harder the longer you play it, not easier. Yeah, right. <laughs> and St. Um, Saint, um, Anthony in his life in the desert, he... He gets to the point where it seems like he's overcome lust. And what does God allow? He allows the, 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 uh, a demon to manifest in the form of the naked queen of Sheba, right? The most beautiful woman who's ever lived. And it's like, oh, you think you've overcome lust, do you? Well, how about this? And 
you know, Anthony's praying and he's praying and he's just depending on God to get him through it. He doesn't say, well, you, you know, I've got the willpower. I don't need to pray right now. I've trained yeah. myself to be able to handle this. I, I've got this, God. Don't worry. I'll deal with the Queen of Sheba. No, he's he's saying I'm going to get through this with God's help. So that's a good example of it. And being grateful for that, too, because one of the things I love about Noah's story is the gratitude. So the first thing he does when leaving the ark, give thanks. He's prompt to acknowledge God's great gift, express his gratitude in words and make a sacrifice in return. And a man's first act when waking in the morning should be one of thanksgiving. There's a great Chesterton insight about this. When it comes to life, the critical thing is whether you take things for granted or take them with gratitude. Take them for granted or take them with gratitude. Mike, what does this mean to you? Being thankful. It's uh, not thinking about my... This is actually... Okay, so actually... Let me restart that. Father Vincent Lampert, the exorcist, was was on a Pints with Aquinas podcast, and he was talking about the dangers of when performing an exorcism, when all of a sudden you start to think, look at what I'm doing, not what is God doing. So it's always orienting it that way is no matter if it's a client that I've acquired or business is going well or whatever is not thinking about me is immediately doing the sign of the cross and looking upward and giving thanks, giving thanks even, and this even in just the, the smallest little ways possible, um, giving thanks for meals right before you eat, saying a prayer over that food. Something that really stuck out to me, Nick, when you you came to, to came to visit was in a room filled with people, my family, that you had just met 10 minutes prior, right before you ate, you closed your eyes and you gave thanks. And I was like, wow. That stuck out to me. I'll never forget that. I'm like, that's beautiful. That's kind of what prompted me to think about that a lot, a lot more. And uh, Father Calvin Robinson also said that, like, how you start your day, I'm paraphrasing, how you start your day is your God. What do you do first right. thing in the morning? Right. And it's so true. The first thing I would do is like, I'd go start the coffee pot, get on my phone and get caught up with the day where now it's like, no, no, no. Before I do any of that, it's like, I'm going to say the creed, our father, three Hail Marys. I'm going to do the first part of the rosary. Even when I'm like groggy, that's the last thing I want to do. That's how I'm orienting. That's how I'm starting my day. That's my way of giving thanks, it's orienting all things toward God and not toward me. Mm, yeah, that's great advice. There's a, an old lady at the church that we go to who told my kids that, um, before you even get out of bed in the morning, right? Before your feet hit the floor, say a prayer. Otherwise, the devil's going to get you, right? As an, it's, <laughs> it's, a, it's, a good a, it's a good way to think about it. So yeah. you need to be on the um, offensive straight away. And that's part yes. of humility. Yeah, I was going to actually come at that from the opposite angle of what Mike did, which is not gratitude about the good stuff, but... I think the difference between an, a bitter atheist or even a bitter Christian and I don't know what the opposite would be, not necessarily joyful, but peaceful, is the absolute certainty that what's happening in your life is perfectly architected for your salvation. And, it, and it's dependent on you and how you respond to it um, as to whether or not it was a good thing or a bad thing and not God. And I see the opposite a lot in people that are wounded. I think they're wounded. At, I don't know by what. Maybe it's pride. It probably would be at bottom. They believe the belief that like they're like, I could have written this story better. I wouldn't have had this person die. I wouldn't have lost this job. I wouldn't have gotten this disease. You know, I could have achieved X, Y, and Z spiritual benefit or life experience without that. I could have just been informed this. And it really does seem to just be hubris to think that you could have written a better story. Right. Um, mm -hmm. That's so, I, I had um, that article called the apostolate of cheerfulness a while back saying that the real root of anxiety is pride similar idea mm -hmm. which is a re again this is what i mean like okay cool you're not fornicating anymore now comes the real hard stuff you think that anxiety or sorrow is a rational response to the circumstances of your life wrong you're wrong it's pride it's another temptation it's just labeled something else and you've bought that lie right yeah 
the idea that a guy could just like step up to the tradition of the church and say like hey check me out i'm i'm not fornicating do i get a medal like it's it's like the guy who's you know that the joke that comics sometimes have like a guy saying why well, I, I take care of my kids it's like you're supposed to like congrats like, <laughs> this is like entry level is now completed uh now let's begin doing it properly uh that's a good way to think of it nick um however you can see how easy it would have been with the storm raging for Noah to have let those doubts overcome him. And part of what we're talking about here, whether it's a storm of anxiety or whatever temptation it is, I think that Noah in the ark actually committing to seeing this through is such a great way for guys to think of their own lives. So next point is that the way Noah rode the storm is a powerful message to modern men. He knew the ark was not only designed according to God's directions, but also protected and guided by him. So even though the storm raged, smashing the ark with waves and shaking everyone inside, Noah knew it couldn't sink. And the seas outside offered nothing but death anyway. So what would be the point of jumping ship? And this is really explaining how the story of the ark works why it matters the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church as the ark of salvation and all catholics must ride the storm today and i would also say that for guys who want to be patriarchs within families your family your household is like a mini ark as well that has to ride the storm of the secular culture around you so you are in this fight like Noah was, this whole thing is an allegory for your situation. And anyone who comes with words of comfort other than just trust God isn't giving you the harsh truth that you need. There's a poem by Chesterton called The Ballad of the White Horse about King Alfred facing the Danish invasion. And the Blessed Virgin appears to him and says, I tell you naught for your comfort, yea, naught for your desire save that the sky grows darker yet and the sea rises higher. So if anything, things will just get worse and you have to accept that. And Aquinas says that God will permit your material desolation if it means that he can use it to draw you closer to him spiritually. And that can be a frightening thing for a father especially to have to face. You both know in a way that sure. let's begin with Mike. Yeah, so there's 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 two things. One, you don't have exactly what you want because God loves you too much mm -hmm. because he knows it'll corrupt you. He knows it'll draw you away from him. Again, it was a conversation I had with Nick about business and whatever. And he goes, yeah, you're not a at X, Y, or Z level because he loves you too much. Nick, there was a, it was a profound like 36 hours we spent together, bro. I reflect on it, it a lot still, yeah. truthfully. Um, and then the second thing is like, you're not supposed to always understand. You're just supposed to trust. And so what comes to mind for me is the the book of Job. And he's sitting there right before, you know, God starts to speak to him. And obviously, you know, he shaved his head. It's like self-flagellation. Self and then God says, where were you when I formed the foundations of the earth? And every time I read that, I, I, right now, I got chills down my spine. It's electrifying. And I just immediately just feel so tiny. And I'm supposed to know. I'm so arrogant to think that I'm supposed to understand God's plan. I just know he loves me and whatever I, whatever I am experiencing is to my benefit, despite it feeling bad and not producing the tingles I want it to produce. <laughs> That's it. That's just what brings me back to, 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 to normal brings my feet on the ground. And that is what effeminacy is, right? The, um, the valuing of pleasure above responsibility or duty or goodness. And so, um, if it does produce anxiety, uh, you know, the, the environment or the, the circumstances of your life, um, beyond the obvious, like physical pain, but the anxiety on top of it, that's, that's the effeminacy, right? Obviously, if you're suffering, if you're starving, if you're impoverished, you know, these, that's understandable, but the, I wouldn't even say anxiety because there, there's even sort of like a justified, like, will, when you lost your job, you, you had a fervor to go 
you know, go provide for your family. That's even, that's not unjust, but like bitterness and sorrow on top of that or resentment toward God, that's where it comes from uh, hubris. And I think if people understood, and maybe this is just the result of being um, somebody who loves stories, but if people saw God as the greatest storyteller ever, then they would actually feel loved by the sort of scenes, the action sequences in their life that were really, really hard. Because what you have is the, the creator of being itself, uh, who is the most intelligent, who is intelligence itself, crafting a story for you to undergo in order that as at the end of it, you're closer to him and you're going to be mad about that. And so the, the, like, again, back to the whole Pareto distribution of sin idea, Catholics who are uh, fretting about the state of the church because of Francis, whatever, like, yeah, you can be critical of what's happening, but if you then become sorrowful or even worse, if you defect, you failed the shit test. You completely failed the shit test here. Yep. That's it. I love that movie analogy. God knows how to tell the story best. I think of that. Sometimes when I'm talking to a guy whose marriage sounds like it's over, right? Like two minutes to midnight. And I'm just excited thinking about the fact that when we turn this round, this is going to need like a Hans Zimmer soundtrack. This is his chance to be a hero and actually figure out what's gone wrong, how to fix it and become 10 times the man he ever was. And you have to flip that switch and say, I, okay, I'm, I'm actually grateful that she's filed for divorce because I deserved it but it hasn't gone through yet. And I know what to do to fix it. It's like an adventure of a sort that extracts all the weakness from you and people need it. It doesn't mean it's pleasant to go through, but it is important. So as with all the characters we're going to look at, ultimately they are all pointing to Christ. Tim's made this point before that the Bible is all about Christ. Like the whole of the old Testament points to Christ as well. So Noah is a type of Christ's perfect manliness. Why? Both stood alone against a sinful world. Noah preached penance and foretold the deluge. Christ preached penance and foretold the last judgment. Noah's sacrifice obtained a covenant with God. Christ's perfect sacrifice obtained pardon, grace, and peace. Noah saved men from the flood with his ark. Christ saves men from hell with his church. As Aquinas said, there is no entering into salvation outside the church, just as in the time of the deluge, there was none outside the ark, which denotes the church. So this the first of the figures of biblical masculinity that we're going to be looking at. Next time we'll look at Abraham. I hope everyone's enjoyed the show today. Mike, Nick, if there's anything that stood out for you or any final reflections you got, let's hear them. That's all for me. I actually have to jet. Perfect timing, Will. Cool. Mike? Yeah, no no reflections besides this was incredibly edifying, and and I'm so stoked to see how this is received and and how this fleshes out, especially with, with Tim in the next one. So thank you, guys. God bless you, dudes. Take care, y'all. God bless you, too. Take care, guys. See you next week.